we have, we're going to jump right in. We're at Cockerel Dramatopathology and we're live right now and this will eventually go on YouTube so you can watch it over and over again and really study the slides if you haven't studied them already. So this is our first unknown. We're going to go through a series of unknowns. Um, we have a beautiful punch biopsy here and it's actually going down into the paniculus. So they did an excellent job taking this punch biopsy. Um, they were very suspicious of, of a dermal process and an inflammatory process. So they, they did a punch, which is really, really important. I know Dr. Cockrell mentioned this yesterday, and I really want to emphasize that as well, because I can't tell you the number of biopsies that I've had to say minimal dermis is seen, and I can't really tell what inflammatory process is going on because literally they shaved across the top of this, and I hope you can see my arrow, but they just shaved the epidermis. Come on in. Hello? Yeah, uh, I'm on video right now. Thank you. Thank you. Just, yeah, close that. Thanks. Um, so with the shave, we would miss all of this dermal process going on. The first thing you notice on low power is this the multifocal process. <clears throat> so and typically you're not going to see that with, let's say, a neoplastic process unless there's some kind of metastasis going on. So um, right away, you're wondering what are these collections here? You're seeing activity. Some of you who are further along may have already guessed what this is and have on low power immediately jumped in on the answer, but we're gonna go through this step-by-step step for the first years. Um, right away, you're noticing these, these areas of activity and you're noticing they're in a circle, they're, they're, they're circular areas, and that kind of goes along with the, uh, the annular configuration clinically. Um, you're seeing this, these collections of cells and these collections are seen to be surrounded by this central area that's somewhat lighter feathery, granular, and blue. Um, also, you notice the entrapped collagen um, in this area. So right away, you're saying, well, these cells don't look malignant. Um, they have a lot of cytoplasm. And when you go on higher power, you right away recognize them as histiocytes because they have very much light chromatin, open chromatin with small nucleoli. And they have plenty of cytoplasm, although the cytoplasm borders are not very well defined. They're, so they're not really epithelioid, they're just histiocytes. They're just plain histiocytes. And you'll see a mixture, you'll see some lymphocytes around this, is occasional lymphocytes. I don't see many eosinophils, but the thing that jumps out at you right away is you see this central area that's sort of feathery, granular, light bluish area. And if you wanted to, you could stain it with a colloidal iron or you could stain it with emulsion blue. And that would say, ah, so this is mucin, it's a palisaded, histiocytic reaction, therefore granulomatous, surrounding this central area of mucin. So, aha, I think this is GA. So let's go through, why isn't this a dermatofibroma? Well, because of the central area with this mucin. And you gotta look at the other areas too. Are you seeing the same thing in this area? Yes, I'm seeing this area. The collagen's degenerating because these histiocytes, they say are releasing uh, lysosomal enzymes and destroying the collagen. And that's why you're getting those mucinous areas. You're not seeing many plasma cells here and you're not seeing the tiered or cake layering that we saw on a previous unknown in one of my lectures where you saw the side to side and top to bottom going to the paniculus. This is slightly getting into the paniculus, but we don't see many plasma cells. If we see a couple, that doesn't mean, oh, it's NLD, because there are a couple. But if you see a lot of plasma cells, you want to think about necrobiosis lipoidica. This entity, so why isn't it a DF? Well, it's not a DF because of the central areas. It's also not a DF because you have these multifocal areas. So let's just say you got stumped and you looked at these histiocytes and you said, well, I think this is a DF. I don't think it's GA. It's just a DF. Well, it's not. And one other way you can check yourself is you can go on low power and look at the overlying epidermis and notice that there's no dirty feet. There's no basal hyperpigmentation or a basaloid hematoma. So, and, and why isn't this an epithelioid sarcoma? Well, again, go on higher power and look at the histiocytes. The NC ratios are not high. Now histiocytes can form mitotic figures because they divide, they grow. Excuse me, hello? Yeah, I'm on a video call. Just come on in and just drop the slide, it's fine. Um, so what we're seeing here are some you know, beautiful histiocytes and they're not epithelioid. You don't see cytoplasmic membranes, but if these cells were epithelioid, you might wanna think about an epithelioid sarcoma. They had high NC ratios, lots of mitotic figures, but it would look very much high, high grade uh, cytologic atypia. 
So you might think about epithelial sarcoma in the differential, but not on this slide, absolutely not. This looks very much benign. Um, other things in the differential, well, there's, uh, there's um, rheumatoid nodule. With rheumatoid nodule, you'll have a location, extensor services, and it'll be much deeper. You'll typically see it in the subcutis. You'll see much well, uh, more well-formed granulomas and more fibrinoid areas in the center, less mucin and more multinucleated giant cells. So that's why you wouldn't think about a rheumatoid nodule here at all. Although, and also it's multifocal, so you wouldn't think about rheumatoid nodule. So those are some of the things in the differential I wanted to talk to you about. Now, why isn't this infectious? Like, why wouldn't you do special stains on this? You could do special stains. You, you might not believe that that's mucin in the center. Um, so what I would do is I would look for organisms anyway. You know, I'd say, well, um, am I 100% convinced that's mucin in the center, this feathery bluish area? not 100% convinced, and maybe this palisade isn't very well formed, you know, it's not forming a good picket fence look. So I might think, well, maybe this is infectious, and sometimes we'll see very well formed palisaded granulomas with areas with a lot more polys, um, neutrophils, and we'll see a lot more giant cells, and then we'll start to move along the infectious route, and we'll want to do a fight stain, we'll want to do a fungal stain, or we'll just want to look for yeast forms, you know, and that would be a deep fungal type infection. <clears throat> so I wouldn't do stains on this one because we had the clinical path correlation. <clears throat> we had um, on the clinical, they said rule out GA. So the take home point on this slide is please, please, if you are suspecting GA clinically, do not do a shave, do a punch because we need the dermis, we need to look. Uh, otherwise, I'll just have, I'll give you the answer. The answer I'll give you is superficial perivascular derm. And these are not the typical features of GA in this area if all I have is a shave. So it's very important to go deeper and get, get dermis if you're suspecting GA. And we do see a lot often we, but definitely look for organisms. Really quickly, just look for organisms. It doesn't hurt to look around and I didn't see any. Um, so we don't really need to do the stains because we have that clinical path correlation. We don't see a lot of neutrophils or giant cells, tons of giant cells. And um, so we wouldn't do it on this case. So this is granuloma annulari. Obviously, they can be a perforating type where these areas can, you can have like a transepidermal elimination where they'll try to actually eliminate the dermis where this inflammation is. Um, you know, the subcutaneous type of GA, which can very much mimic a rheumatoid nodule. So you really, and you have the interstitial GA. Now, interstitial GA won't have very form, uh, very, um, ill-formed, if at all, palisades. There'll be no palisades, it's just the interstitial histiocytes. Again, you'll, you might need a clinical path correlation on that, but typically you'll see the histiocytes percolating in the dermis um, without the palisade and a little bit of mucin. You'll see a, a little uh, wisps of mucin every now and then you can see it, or sometimes no mucin at all. And you have to say, hey, this is interstitial GA. Um, there's a lot of histiocytes and they're percolating in the dermis. All right, anything else we need to discuss? We did discuss the colloidal iron and alcian blue. Will they ask you about the stains? Possibly on your test. Um, the vascular changes, you don't see many that must, must uh, much vascular changes in this entity. You'll see more vascular changes in NLD. So that's a good way to differentiate those. Um, they say, you know, the histogenesis, I don't really like to get into histogenesis because it's evolving so quickly, but they're just saying about the histiocytes releasing the lysosomes and causing this degeneration of the collagen and elastin fibers. And that will basically um, lead to this process. Um, the other thing is immunofluorescence. Yeah, we might see a little IgM and C3 around the vessels. Um, so really, uh, that's pretty much all we can say about GA. Again, the clinical is very important. You know, we like you to give us your thoughts on that and definitely put that on the rack. Anytime you're having those thoughts, definitely put it on the rack. Always check, always, again, always check your stratum corneum pertinia on every inflammatory dermatitidae, even if it's just GA down there, always look around and make sure there's no tinea up here. <clears throat> All right, we're gonna go on to case two. This is a beautiful example of this. It's um, I'm sure some of the some of the uh, higher level residents already have jumped on an answer and have a differential in their head because they're 
awesome at low power. And you might begin to say what you think this is on low power. And now we're going to go into high power and confirm it. So it's really important when you think you know an entity to still study it very carefully so that you can go on high power during a test and start to confirm it. Because you have six, seven, eight minutes on this slide. You want to spend time confirming your answer because someone may look at this and say, well, gee, there, there's a paleness here. There's a, is this edema in the papillary dermis? It looks, is this kind of a photo reaction or is this some kind of radiation process or so you want to go on high power because you're looking on, on low power and saying, well, this could be lichen sclerosis. This could be a top, even could this be a top morphia? No, this doesn't look like morphia down here. The collagen isn't very sclerotic and it's very separated down here. So your differential now is starting to form. Could this be radiation? Could this be LS? Could this be some kind of an inflammatory process with dermal edema? Could this be amyloid? No, it doesn't look like amyloid. It's very pale looking, very, very pale. And homogenization of the collagen is going on. The radii are wiped out. Um, so you're not thinking about some kind of macular amyloid or, or other amyloid, more nodular amyloid. When you see nodular amyloid, you actually see the nodules of the amyloid, and you're not seeing that here. You're seeing some ectasia here. These are either some blood vessels here, and you're seeing some ectasia of these lymphatic vessels. You're also seeing um, not so many melanocytes here, which may explain, explain the clinical appearance of this porcelain white lesion that can be plaque-like on the um, genital areas. An example it can also be in other parts of the body, it can also be in children and adults. But you, you're seeing a decrease in melanocytes. You'll see a couple of melanocytes in here, but the reedy are wiped out and the melanocytes are decreased and the melanin is decreased. So that's why you're getting this clinical appearance. Um, the first thing you need to really look for, if you are suspecting this is lichen sclerosis, is you need to to look at this, this tri-layer uh, appearance. You have hyperkeratosis here, atrophy. We don't see much hydropic degeneration, but you do see the, the pale homogenization of the collagen, and then you see this layer and this patchy band-like area of inflammation. This lesion is, is sort of in the middle of its course. If it, was an, if it were an early lesion, you'd see a band of, of inflammation mimicking lichen planus. <clears throat> but, a more developed lesion will get very sclerotic. It won't look so pale and homogenized and somewhat edematous with these lymphatic vessels. It, it'll look more sclerotic and, and more eosinophilic. So as the lesion develops, there'll be less inflammation and more sclerosis. So this lesion is sort of in the middle of its course. So this is a beautiful example of lichen sclerosis. Other names is uh, balanitis erotica. Um, Curosis uh, vulvae um, can be another name for this. It's all the same name. They might put that on your test. They might say balanitis erotica, and you're looking at it thinking LSNA, quickly go down and pick balanitis because it's on the gland. So, but it would look exactly the same, um, balanitis erotica and uh, chorosis vulvae. So infants can get this. I just saw a case the other day of an infant that had it, um, a six month old. Um, again, you'll see papules and plaques that will evolve into a figure eight or a keyhole in the general or extra general region. Um, in my notes, some of the things I wanted to bring up um, that are important is that the, the reedy ridges are gone. So that's a very key feature. And how to differentiate it from radiation. Radiation, you're going to see bizarre fibroblasts. So take a second to look in here and see these fibroblasts. There's not many fibroblasts. The fibroblasts are very much decreased. I'm having trouble finding one. I think here, we have one here, and that one does not look bizarre. When you have a bizarre fibroblast, you're gonna see intranuclear vacuoles. You're gonna see a large nucleus, much larger than normal for a fibroblast, and it'll have some intranuclear inclusions and vacuoles and the irregular, but it won't be high enough NC ratio to look malignant, but it'll, because the cytoplasm grows with the size of the nucleus. So those bizarre fibroblasts, you have to look for those, and that, that'll tell you it's radiation and radiation can look very sclerotic. So radiation is a mimicker. The other key feature is the, the, the um, hair is wiped out here. The appendage, um, appendages are just wiped out. <clears throat> you don't see any here. Um, and this was hair bearing skin. Um, <clears throat> so that's pretty much it on this case. We've exhausted it. Just to drill down on the epidermis, um, it gets atrophic because the basalis layer and the uh, spinosum layer are decreased 
and that's why it's atrophic. It actually gets to be thinned. This is not a pre-malignant condition, but it can be seen in association with malignancies. So it is important to look at this epidermis and make sure there's no squamous uh, cell carcinoma in situ. But don't overcall this. Don't say, oh, there's mild dysplasia here. Don't do that. I mean, this, this is not dysplasia here. This is atrophy of the epidermis. And again, look at your keratin layer. You don't have any parakeratosis here. So if you start going off the rails and saying, this is dysplastic, I think it's a pre, no, no, no. Look at your keratin layer and see there's no parakeratosis. And that'll help you back off of AK or something crazy if you start going down that route where you say, well, maybe this is just an inflamed AK. Don't do that. Don't go off the rails. So lichen sclerosis at atrophicus. I think I went over everything in the differential, really um, exhausted it. <laughs> All right, next case is a gorgeous punch. I really love these punches. That's probably why they end up in these shows because we're getting an absolute gorgeous biopsy. Someone suspected an inflammatory uh, dermatinity. They had suspected they had a macular papular rash. It was somewhat pigmented. Um, there were there was several several of these lesions on the, the the trunk and extremities. I actually saw the clinical photo of this. It was actually quite helpful um, because you know the first biopsy on this just had a superficial perivascular dermatitis with some scattered cells, but the second biopsy, this is the part B of the case, um, actually had this sheet of cells, and it's somewhat of a papule. It's somewhat of a macule and a papule combined um, clinically and, and histologically. You could imagine that what this looked like clinically. <clears throat> and right away, you see these, this grouping of cells and you're saying to yourself, well, could this be a nevus? And you're like, no, these really don't look like nevus cells. They're somewhat spindled. The, the cytoplasm just all wrong for nevus. Um, and I don't see a junctional component here. This just doesn't look like a nevus. It's not nested. Um, it's, it's somewhat band like so am I going to go off the rails and think this is uh, lichen planus? No way, because these aren't lymphocytes. Um, there's too much cytoplasm for these to be lymphocytes. Um, what I have is a ton of cytoplasm, and the cytoplasm's amphiphilic, meaning it picks up basic and acidic dyes. So it's a picking up a little bit of the eosin and a little bit of the uh, hematoxylin. That's how I think of it. So its color is between the color of these cells and the eosin down here. So can you visualize what amphiphilic is? It's, it's in between these two colors. <clears throat> um, and sometimes it, it's, it's moving a little bit toward the basophilic. You know, it, color is a hard thing. It is a subjective thing. Um, and that these are somewhat spindled is subjective too. They're ovoid to spindled. Some of them are more spindled. They're more cigar shaped and others are more oval and others are out and out round. So, but they all seem to be the same cell type. So right away, you're thinking, well, could these be histiocytes? Well, maybe this is an eosinophilic granuloma. Oh, wait, I see eos. Is it? No, but these, these nuclei, I don't look around for them. Is this lymphomatoid papulosis? No, I don't see those really bizarre multinucleated cells here. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to stain this. You know, I'm thinking about maybe these, these are mast cells. Gee, because they have that spindle appearance. I, I might want to stay in this because I'm not absolutely certain that these are mast cells because they're sort of spindle. They look weird. And I, I haven't seen this many mast cells. I mean, there's over 250. I mean, there's, there's thousands of cells here. There's over 250. So there's a pathology here. You shouldn't have this many mast cells in the dermis. There's over 250 mast cells per millimeter. Um, so I want to do a stain on this. I'm not absolutely certain. Um, the clinical isn't giving me any clues. They're saying these are brown macular papular lesions and uh, there's multiple in the trunk and extremity. Um, I think I would like to do um, a stain on this and I'd like to do a trip case because I want to rule out mast cells here um, and or I want to prove that they're mast cells actually is what I want to do. I'm suspecting they're mast cells because they're mononuclear. Now a mast cell isn't a basis, basophil. A basis, basophil has two lobes and it's in typically in the peripheral blood, not in um, the tissue. So this is sort of related to a basophil, these mast cells. So these are mast cells. Some people can look at these and see that they're slightly spindled, see the amphiphilic cytoplasm, boom, mast cells. Now the question is, is, is it a mastocytoma or is it, um, is it TMAP? No, TMAP is usually just superficial perivascular with mast cells scattered around. Or is it um, urticaria pigmentosa? Hmm. 
So now I'm going to get my stain to confirm that these are triptase positive. And, <clears throat> and we have that here. We have positivity. And you can see the brown stain even from here. Let me get it where it isn't cracked. Uh, let's see, I think this is the best one. So these cells definitely are staining. The vast majority of them are staining the triptase. So <clears throat> triptase is in the secretory granules of the mast cells. And when you have systemic mastocytosis, you'll see an increase in the serum tryptase. And you can see these are activated mast cells because they have um, the tryptase in them. Other stains we can do, and they'll ask you this on multiple guest tests, Ginza, toluene blue, and it's the metachromasia. You know, oh, what does metachromasia mean? Well, methylene blue is a blue stain, and it turn, when you use methylene blue here, it'll turn these granules purple. So that's the definition of meta metachromasia. Um, in tissue. So the stain methylene blue is a metachromatic stain and these granules are metachromatic. And it's a very confusing concept, but they love to show you that gene sustained or, or toluene blue stained mast cell and, and show you that on a test. Um, and other stains are leader stain that can stain the C, CD117 and C kit. Don't forget about CD117 and C kit. And why is this different? Now, if I had the, only this area, let's go back to the other slide a second. If I only had this area here, I might say on a report, there's an increase in mast cells, superficial perivascular derm with an increase in mast cells. And basically what I'm asking you all to do is clinically correlate. And normal skin can have mast cells in the lower extremity in the forearm more typically. So if you see 10 or 15 mast cells, that doesn't automatically equal Tmap or it doesn't auto automatically equal uh, mastocytosis, cutaneous mastocytosis. So we'll suggest it to you. And <clears throat> what we're asking for you is for a clinical path correlation. So um, that's why you know, we, we tend to try to count them a little bit here and there. And if there's over 250, that is cutaneous mastocytosis by definition. But still, we want that we want the correlation because you're going to be looking around on that stain and it's going to be rough counting them because sometimes <clears throat> there's some non-specific staining. So you really have to look at the nuclei of the cells. So this was urticaria pigmentosa where there was a perfect clinical path correlation because we actually saw the clinical slide. The brownish lesions. Now, why are these lesions brownish? It's, this is an important little uh, fun fact. So as you're, you're honing in on whether this could be urticaria pigmentosa, you'll notice there's an increase in melanin in the basal layer. Somehow these mast cells um, activate the melanocytes to produce more melanin. So you'll have an increase in, in melanin in this, in this basal layer, which explains the clinical appearance. So I wanted to bring that up really quickly. So we went through the stains. We talked about CKIT, CD117. So definitely write that down. The leader stain, toluene blue, the tryptase stain, and Gimsa. <clears throat> Any other things I can tell you about the serum levels? Well, obviously, it's in systemic mastocytosis. You'll see an abnormal serum level of the tryptase. Um, <clears throat> they are related to basophils. But again, I don't want to get into histogenesis of the progenitor cell that might be related and all of that because it's evolving and it's changing. Um, <clears throat> the nucleus, it's important to recognize it's round to spindle. And that's how you're going to be able to recognize it on a test. They may not, they're not going to give you the stain and they're going to say, they may show you a mastocytoma, which is just one nodule or one to three. After you start getting more than four no, uh, lesions, you need to start thinking about urticaria pigmentosa because a mastocytoma will typically be one or two lesions. And you can get mast cell leukemia. So that would be the malignant. Um, you'd have to do a bone marrow and work the patient up fully and do that bone marrow and look for the mast cells in the bone marrow. So um, <clears throat> that's something um, that you might want to think about first. But don't do the bone marrow unless you think there's leukemia there. You might want to do the peripheral, the peripheral um, smear, you know, the peripheral um, CBC with diff first. And obviously, you can see a bullous, bullous lesions in children. That You don't want to forget about the bullous lesions. Occasionally, you'll see a cleft occur, um, and you'll see the mast cells beneath it. So you can have different variations of this. <clears throat> Eosinophilic granuloma, if you want to, you can use the CD1A stain. 
you see scattered EOs here. And if you didn't believe these were mast cells and your triptase wasn't, you know, you definitely wanted to rule out eosinophil granuloma. These aren't reniform, so it's really out. There's no epidermotropism. So I just wouldn't think of that entity, but you could do a CD1 A and S100 to rule out, um, you know, something like an eosinophil granuloma, litter seaweed, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, et cetera. And, and, and again, you can have mast cells in atopic, derm, and lichen planus, a couple of LSC, and normal skin. So mast cells don't automatically in, in equal pathology. Let's get on to the next case. I know you guys have to get going and we wanna get through these. Um, we went over that pretty much ad nauseum. Um, this is the next case. And we have a beautiful nodule here that's very well circumscribed. <clears throat> It, is it encapsulated? Well, we might want to hone in. And I always try to look at the periphery first and what's going on. We're missing some epidermis here, so it's not going to be helpful. <clears throat> it's a little bit tangentially cut. So, but the epidermis I can see, there's nothing going on up there. There's no um, malignancy of these cells here. So right away, you know, because I'm looking at, I'm thinking, you know, there's this nodule deep in the dermis. Could this be a met? Could this be a cyst? <clears throat> Could this be a proliferating pilar tumor or a tricholemal cyst? But then when I go in on higher power, I start to notice there's two populations of cells. I've shown this. I like to show this slide because sometimes we don't get very good biopsies. We'll only get a tiny little piece and we'll get just these cells here. And it's very hard to differentiate from a basal cell. But you have these basophilic cells here and they're very basaloid. There's indistinct uh, cytoplasmic borders, hyperchromatic nuclei you can see occasional mitoses. And you start to think, well, maybe this is malignant. And then you see these cells in this area where there's no nuclei. There's, they're very clear. The nucleus is lost or missing. Your so-called shadow and ghost cells. And you just say, yippee, I've got it. It's a pilomatricoma, calcifying epithelial amalur. Yay. You don't see much calcification here. And then you look into these areas <clears throat> for multinucleated giant cells, and you see them right away. And you say, hey, this is a ruptured one. These giant cells are reacting to this material that the shadow cells, these islands of shadow cells, it's reacting to it just like it would keratin in a cyst. Now, if this were a tricholemal cyst, you would see uh, more palisading to this, these basophilic areas. You would see some eosinophilic cells that had nuclei here as well. And then you know, you'd see the lining of the cyst basically. Um, and you'd see um, compact hyperkeratosis, you wouldn't see these shadow cells. So that's why you can pretty much eliminate a tricholemal cyst here because the basaloid cells are, are in a sheet and you don't, this isn't the wall of a cyst here. This is just basaloid islands. So get that tricholemal cyst immediately out of your head and then you see the shadow cells. You don't see shadow cells with tricholemal cyst or proliferating pilar tumor. Um, a, a, a pilar tumor is a proliferating trichloroma cyst. You don't, you don't, you don't see that. So, again, this I would call it ruptured, and it's not a malignant process. It's a totally benign process, and this is supposedly hair matrix, um, dif hair matrix differentiation here. So it's it's coming from that area. You can polarize this, and it's birefringent. Um, what are the things can I tell you? The calcium, you can do a von Kossa stain. There's no calcium in this. I look pretty hard you know, dystrophic calcifications inside the cyst. And you can also see that with a pilar cyst. So don't just see calcifications and jump on pilar tumor. You know, look around for the basaloid uh, nests. And um, this is a benign process, even though if I only had this on a shave, I could get very confused. I might think this is a basal cell. And then I might see a little bit of keratin. And I had a case like that the other day. There was a little bit of keratin. I saw the shadow cells and I said, this looks like the surface of a, uh, a pilometricoma. So watch out, you know, be very, very careful. So here's your pilometricoma. So let's move on to the next case. Oops. All righty. We have another nodule in the dermis. You have a nice punch, sort of a punch excisional biopsy. This is a huge punch. And we have this process that looks like it's um, infiltrating. It is somewhat circumscribed, but if you look at the edges of this, it's infiltrating into the collagen. The stroma is very dense and sclerotic. And if you look on high power, the highest power we have, you're starting to see mitoses. 
all over the place, high NC ratios. And this is what I mean by high NC ratio and nuclear atypia. And if you're, you have doubts about, well, is this nuclear atypia? Just look around for a red blood cell or look around for a lymphocyte and see that the cells are 20 times, uh, nuclei of the cells are 10 to 20 times bigger. So try to find a red blood cell. Here's some reds clumped, but look around for, or look around for a lymphocyte and, and compare the, a normal cell to the size of these nuclei. And you'll say these are huge, huge cells. I mean, they're huge and their NC ratios are high and there's tons of mitoses and there's nuclear pleomorphism, high grade nuclear atypia. This is, this is classic for it. So now the question is, is this a squamous cell? Well, I don't see keratinization here. I'm looking around and I don't see intercellular bridging to see the differentiation that you would see in a squamous cell. Don't confuse this collagen for keratin. Don't make that mistake. Um, also, what other, we don't see melanin in these cells. You have to look in these cells for melanin um, to say, well, could this be some kind of melanoma? No, this doesn't look like a melanoma. These cells look real epithelioid. So, and then I'm starting to see some glandular differentiation here. The minute you start to see glandular differentiation, you better be thinking about a MET right away. Think about a met, met, uh, metastatic adenocarcinoma and then to start to think about where it's coming from. If you, so you go off track and think, well, could this be a primary skin and nexal adenocarcinoma? Um, you, you, know, you, you might want to do stains if you thought about that. But I think when you have this, this uh, process going on with all of these glands, you really, really need to start to think about the possibility of a MET and where it's coming from. And this looks like a carcinoma. It does not look like a sarcoma because it's not spindled. It doesn't look like a lymphoma because these cells have too much cytoplasm. This doesn't look like any lymphoma I can think of. First of all, lymphomas don't form glands. So in the minute you start seeing the glands, that's why you really have to look around and look for differentiation when you get a tumor like this, some kind of differentiation, you're seeing glandular lumina. So uh, here's another gland. <clears throat> you start seeing that and look, you can see that this is a true lumen. It's not just um, a cystic space like here, that's a true lumen. So you have to be able to differentiate true lumen from just those cystic areas or just fat, you know, in, in between. So here's a nice uh, gland here. I mean, I think this fits pretty well for a gland. Right here, dead center. Here's a beautiful gland that's in dead center. Um, so some of the things that are differential are metastatic lesions from the lung, from the breast, you know, from, from all over the body. And what we want to do is we want to start to think about staining it. If you really think this is a primary skin and nexal adenocarcinoma, you can do stains for that as well. Um, this, th this was on the breast. I remember the location was breast and the patient had history of breast cancer. And it has an appearance of the typical for breast. And I'll show you some areas where there are clues. This is another slide of the same case. When you start to see this cribiforming area, it's in these, uh, these calcifications, it's very reminiscent of, of breast because this looks almost introductal, but there's no, there's no myoepithelial layer. So this is an invasive cribiform nest or group or island. So if you look at this tumor and you look at that area, that looks like breast for sure. Um, because it looks like in situ breast, uh, but it's not. It's infiltrating in this area, but it's mimicking the in situ ductal, um, in situ, almost a comedo or cribiform type. So that's a reason that when you looked at the second slide, you're like, oh, this is breast for sure. And if you've seen enough breast cancer cases, it's very much looking like that. You can do an ER um, stain. You can do a CK7 and 20. The CK7 will be positive, the 20 will be negative, which you can also see a 7 positive and a 20 negative with lung cancer. So you want to do the TTF. The, the TTF is negative. You can start to move away from lung cancer. But the main thing is that the ER is positive and it has a very high, high, high predictive value for breast cancer. Um, we can also do the PR. And for the oncologist, they'll definitely want the hair to st new stain. Um, so we do those three because when it goes to the oncologist, it'll uh, affect what treatment they'll be giving the, the patient. So this was a metastatic um, <clears throat> breast adenocarcinoma. Um, some of the take home points, 
is um, you, you probably should stain it if you have any doubts that um, where it's coming from. And if this is a male, obviously, you know, it's, it can be breast. So the other thing is with the primary skin and nexal carcinoma, do, you can do the P63. The P63 will be positive with the nexal carcinoma. So that'll help you get away from thinking about an nexal adenal carcinoma. So remember that P63 is also a D240, can be positive in a CK15. And there's focal staining for CK7, whereas CK7 will be diffusely positive in these cells for, um, for um, metastatic breast. And the gross cystic disease fluid protein, don't forget about that one. That's another one. And mammoglobin. Mammoglobin can be positive with a Nexel, but it'll be focal staining, it'll be scattered. So there are some of the stains you can do to prove that it's breast. <clears throat> or some people can just look at this and say, wow, that looks like breast. This is metastatic breast. It's on the breast and they want you to rule out breast. And then just do your ERPR and HER2 and the ERPR are positive. Well, you're in good shape. And that's actually what happened here. In this case, the ERPR were strongly positive. This is a very, this is an interesting case. You have a shave biopsy and this is a pretty good shave. I mean, they didn't do a punch and they were suspecting an inflammatory dermatitidy. Um, and you're looking at this and saying, wow, this is somewhat psoriasiform. Is, it's acanthotic and somewhat irregular psoriasiform. Is this psoriasis? Well, let me drill down and see. Well, I don't see hypogranulosis and there's not thinning of the suprapapillary uh, plates. And I'm not seeing newts in the stratum corneum, but wait, let me look around some more. I'm only looking at this one piece. Be sure when you're on the test to look at all the pieces as quickly as you can. You know, on low power, scoot around and say, hey, wait a minute, what's that? What is that? I definitely want to hone in on this. Uh-oh, there's a pustule. And if you look on higher power, it's somewhat messy looking, these cells. When the cells look messy and they have multiple lobes, those are neutrophils, polymorphonuclear leukocytes. They're multilobated so-called Mickey Mouse ears. They look like Mickey Mouse ears. Um, so this is a pustule and it's subcorneal. So you may go off the rails and say, oh, it's pustular psoriasis. It's, it's Sneddon Wilkinson and you're going off the, you know, you're saying all this differential and it could be, it could be. But when you see newts in the stratum corneum, think infection, could this be superficial fungal? Also think about the possibility of um, infantigenized process. So I want to look on my stratum corneum very closely. I'm seeing some trash up here. Those bacteria, no, those don't look like cocci. Looks like debris. And I'm looking around and saying, wait a minute, is this a sandwich sign here? Is this getting to be the so-called Ackerman sandwich sign where you see compact um, keratin um, juxtaposed to the basket weave orthokeratosis? Um, sandwich sign, you can see in a lot of entities. You can see it in pleva, you can see it in PRP, you can see it in guttate psoriasis. So you can't use the sandwich sign completely, but this is suspicious enough that when I see newts here, I better rule out a fungal, a, pro, um, a superficial fungal infection, a tinea, so, or, or even candidiasis. I, I better rule it out. So I did get a PS stain on this case. I'm looking around and I'm not easily finding these hyphae. So we're not just doing the PAS to pat our wallet or to pay for our immunostainer. We're doing it because they're very hard to find, especially with some inflammation in here, uh, the hyphae. And you, well, maybe there's one right there. There you go. There's a couple right here. But some of you who say, well, are those really septi? <clears throat> On the test, they're going to show you tinea that's teeming up there. So remember, when you're looking at an inflammatory process and you're like, what the heck is this? be sure to look in your stratum corneum for tinea because they love to show you stuff like this and get you go calling it pustular psoriasis, get you to call it Sten Wilkinson and all this stuff, but you better look very carefully in that stratum corneum. And if they show it on the boards, they'll show it with a lot of organisms because they're only going to show it to you on H&E. And I think there are organisms in here, but this wasn't enough for me to put on a board exam. Um, it was difficult because I, we needed the stain all right, so let me see if I can find um, these hyphae on these stains. So let's get the stain. Well, I really want to just use the stain. I want to move on with my day. I got to move quicker here and get to the bottom of it. And let's see on this PAS. Aha. Let me put some. Let me see if this is the best piece. Here we go. 
All right, well, so we have the sandwich sign and we have the hyphae sandwiched in between the basket weave and the compact area. So this is a nice, beautiful sandwich sign with the hyphae, you see the septae, you see some branching. Um, they don't look like pseudo hyphae because they're more angles and not 90 degree, you'll see more 90 degree. Also with candida, it'll start to move into the epidermis, whereas tinea doesn't. So tinea can include you know, your epidermophyton, uh, trichophyton, and uh, microsporum um, organisms. Um, they're staining very nicely here. Now, don't go off the rails and think this is tinea versicolor because you see a couple of these hyphae cut and cross section. Don't do that. You know, the meatballs and spaghetti. Tinea versicolor, you'll see more spores. And Canada, you'll see spores, but the spores will be bigger. They'll be six microns spores. So you have to see bigger spores for Canada and you have to see the hyphae going vertically, not staying horizontally or parallel to the epidermis. So this is not Canada. This is just plain old tinea. So that's how I'm telling you to tell the difference because they may show you Canada on a test because they'll show you bigger spores. Now this is a superficial fungal infection. Don't confuse this with a deep. That's why if you suspect deep fungal infection, you've got to give us a deep punch biopsy. Don't give us a superficial shave if you're suspecting uh, to deep fungal, because this is a superficial fungal infection. Now, when you have a superficial fungal infection, tinea corporis in this case, because it was on the body, if it's tinea capitis, especially in a child, be sure to look in the hairs down here. Take a quick look and try to find some hair. Well, this is in scalp, so we don't see much uh, hair that we can look at, but try to find some hairs and look in the hairs. We don't have any hairs to look at. But you want to make sure you don't miss an endothrix or an ectothrix. Endothrix, when the, the hyphae and spores are in the canidia, are inside the hair shaft, and ectothrix, when it's laying on top of the hair shaft. So because it changes the treatment, they, if it's an endothrix, they may have to get systemic treatment. Um, so this um, is tinea infection, dermatophyto, uh, dermatomycosis, um, dermatophytosis. Uh, if it's dermatiaceous, well, you'll see brown. You know, when we, show, we showed a tinea nigra the other day. They may show you tinea nigra on the board. I think I had that on my board exam because you could see it so easily because the hyphae were brown. <clears throat> and I showed you one of those that mimics melanoma on the foot. Um, I think I showed one the last time. So sandwich sign isn't perfect, but it's a, it's a great way to start to suspect um, tinea and then to order a PAS. <clears throat> so we went over that. We pretty much beat that. But they, they will show you that on the board. I had one of those. Um, they, like to, they like you to miss it because you're not looking in the stratum corneum. You're so focused on the dermis and trying to figure out what the heck's going on in the dermis and the epidermis that you don't even look at the stratum corneum. So don't forget to go through your, system, um, your systematic way of looking at a slide from top to bottom or bottom to top. I don't care, but just do it one way or the other. Um, here's a beautiful case. <clears throat> it's obviously something's really active in this punch biopsy. Um, there's a process going on that has taken over the upper dermis, the mid dermis, the, the, the lower dermis, and into the, into the paniculus. Right away, um, the first thing that you notice is that you're seeing some brown in this tumor, and you're wondering, is this the ink that they put on the punch? or is this truly some kind of pigment? So my eye, I see all these cells and I'm worried a little bit. And right away, my eye is drawn to these areas of pigmentation. I'm thinking, wait a minute, this is the edge of the biopsy. Is that just ink? Nope, it's not ink. You really wanna hone in on this area here. And right away you say, wait a minute, this isn't ink. This is pigment inside the cells. And you might wanna rack up and down your condenser if you're using a microscope to see if it's somewhat refractile. If it's somewhat refractile, you think more about hemocytorin. If it's not, it's more finely granular and not so globular. You would think about melanin. And there's this is melanin, and these processes are slender, and these cells are very long. And these processes are dendritic processes, so-called dendritic processes. Um, and these cells, this is melanin. So right away, I'm thinking, you know, this is some kind of nevus. Um, and I'm looking at the rest of the cells, which have no melanin, and the rest of the cells look somewhat ovoid, somewhat spindled. Here they're cut in cross section, so they look ovoid, and in other areas they look spindled because they're not cut, they're cut longitudinally. 
And then I have this structure here, which I'm not sure is it smooth muscle or is it nerve? It's kind of big, but is it, is it smooth muscle or nerve is going through my head right now. <clears throat> it's sort of near this follicle, so it looks like it's pilar um, uh, smooth muscle. But then I have other areas in this tumor that are very strange and that looks somewhat neural. I'm trying to find it better. Somewhat neural areas. You have to really study this tumor. Some of this sort of looks wavy and it somewhat looks neural to me. And that's Schwannian differentiation, the so-called Schwannian differentiation. And in nevi, so we think that this might be melanocytic because we saw the melanin and they're in those dendritic cells. And when you see dendritic cells, everybody just jumps on a blue nevus and they should jump on it because that's what this is. This is a blue nevus. Um, and that's the key feature here. If you, if you look at the tumor overall and you start to see areas like this, like it's dead in the middle of the, of the, the, the screen, <clears throat> you have to go on high power and start to look at this and say, wait a minute, these are dendritic processes and there's melanin in here. And this looks like a blue nevus in this area. And then the rest of this has these pale, pale um, cytoplasm and these spindled cells with these interlacing fascicles. It's not story form to me and the NC ratios are not very high at all. That's why I'm not thinking about a DFSP and saying, oh, is this a Bednar tumor? I'm not thinking about that at all because these cells don't have high enough NC ratios for me to think about a DFSP here. And it isn't beautifully story form like I like to see with a DFSP. So, to, and with these dendritic um, processes, these slender filled with melanin, I'm thinking about a blue nevus. And right away, when you're thinking about a blue nevus and it's this huge and it's involving the paniculus, on your test, you will get a blue nevus. Uh, they're gonna put it on your test multiple times in multiple, uh, you know, uh, questions just without slides and questions with slides. They love blue nevus because they want to show you, well, there can be a mitosis here and there, but if you start seeing a lot of mitoses and you see a lot of atypia and high NC ratios and necrosis, and you see right away go to the epidermis, you start to see an intraepidermal component, you need to steer away from blue nevus and start steering toward a melanoma or a malignant blue nevus, which I hate to use that term. But Again, look at your epidermal component. If you start seeing mitoses in this thing and the ratios are kind of high and you do see the dendritic cells and you're thinking about a blue nevus because you see those dendritic cells, don't go off the rails and call it malignant melanoma. <clears throat> look for the intraepidermal component before you go off doing that because on the board, they like you to overcall. And I'm gonna tell you that right now because then they can justify failing someone because they're overcalling things malignant that aren't malignant. This tumor here is perfectly benign. It's a blue nevus. It's somewhat sclerotic in areas and in other areas it's cellular. So it's exhibiting a couple of the features of the subtypes of blue nevi. This isn't a combined nevus or anything like that because blue nevi can be combined with interdermal nevi, junctional nevi, um, um, compound nevi, and spitz nevi. So it doesn't have that. But it has this Schwannomian differentiation here and this is what I was trying to find before. You see how it looks sort of spindle there and neurotized? Schwannian differentiation is common in a blue nevus. So this is a beautiful blue nevus. It's big, it's deep, and it's scary. <clears throat> but when you look around and you don't see any mitoses and the NC ratio, NC ratio is this low, then you know it's not malignant. It's a blue nevus and you can completely get it right on the board and you won't go calling this thing malignant when it's not. But they'll show you a, a more cellular blue nevus than this. This is more sclerotic, but they'll show you a very cellular one and they're going to try and it might be bulging into the paniculus and they're going to try to get you to overcall. So be careful. Use your criteria of necrosis, high mitotic rate and an intraepidermal component. And it could be an atypical blue, and that's fine. You could call it an atypical blue. But atypical blue isn't a malignant process. It's atypical, and they can rarely metastasize. So the stain I would do for this, and we did do it. This is the control. Don't look over there. Here's the tissue. Yeah, don't forget that's the control. So don't look at that. Look, Try to find the punch. It's folded when you re-review these. <clears throat> but in this area, you'll see nuclear staining. 
with the immunohistochemical stain, it's SOX10 transcription factor involved in neural crest. <clears throat> so you can see it in melanocytic processes, which this is, but you can also see it in salivary gland tumors. You can see it in myoepithelial cells and breast cancers. So it's not perfect for met melanoma, but you can definitely use your SOX10 here to prove this is the intradermal uh, process that's a benign blue nevus that arose in this site. So this is just a benign blue nevus arose in this site, SOX10 positive, totally benign. You can move on to your next case. But it did look scary there. It's not a DFSP, but if you wanted to prove it, you could do a CD34, which would be positive and the DFSP should be negative here. Um, DF it wouldn't be in your differential. Um, for me, it just wouldn't be there, but if you did think it was a DF for some strange reason, um, neural could be in your differential, um, but the case, you know, where you see those dendritic processes um, and you see those spindled cells, you would definitely think about blue before you would think about, um, with a DFSP of Bednar, you're going to see the melanin more in the macrophages and in the, sometimes they'll pick up in some of the tumor cells, but you won't see it, you won't see those dendritic processes in a Bednar. All right, here we go on to the next case. All right, we're almost, oh, no, we're actually done. We're going to stop here. Oh, no, no, we'll, yeah, we should stop here. We'll stop with the blue because I wanted to leave you with that because I believe they will test you on that. It's SOX10, S100, HMB45 can be positive in those. Um, they will test you on blue. You're going to get blue constantly and you're probably going to get it on a slide. I think they put like three blue, blue nevi on my test. They love blue nevi, just like in the anatomic portion of the path boards, they like to give you a carcinoid on cytology and try to get you to call it a small cell carcinoma of the lung. So they want you to overcall because if you, well, they don't want you to, they want you to pass the test. But if you overcall, that would be a reason to miss the question and it would be a bad thing if you were overcalling things malignant when, when they're not. So that would be a justification for them. So they do tend to find things that are difficult, like that last case, to think about that being benign. But anyway, I'm going to leave you guys with that. Take care. Have a great day. And um, please review the slides at your leisure. Bye.